Hey, it's Eric Newcomer. Welcome back to Cerebral Valley. This is episode two. I'm here with Max Child and James Wilsterman. Uh, we are going to dig into, we're calling this episode AI Kills Us All, which will uh, give you a taste. Uh, it's uh, not not the small questions, you know, what, what to do about privacy or like, you know, who should be in charge. It's like, what happens if we get uh, artificial general intelligence. What? How worried are we about sort of the big doom and gloom? Uh, guys, uh, great, great to be back with you. Great to be back. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Great to be here. After my conversation with Max and James, I will be interviewing Daniel H. Wilson, the author of How to Survive a Robot Uprising, Where's My Jetpack, and How to Build a Robot Army, and the bestseller, Robopocalypse. So <laughs> someone who has spent a lot of time imagining uh, the doom and gloom of machines uh getting powerful so that's he, he's an expert in the speculation where we are mere amateurs you know with of course the help of chat gpt i was you know looking wandering the internet uh looking for uh the great thinkers on uh agi's coming and one of them is nick bostrom who's been writing about this for years i think so this piece this is the essay from his book, um, Super Intelligence. Uh, the essay is called The Unfinished Fable of the Sparrows, which is very enjoyable, and I, I think you'll get a lot out of it. It was the nest building season, but after days of long hard work, the sparrows sat in the evening glow, relaxing and chirping away. We are all so small and weak. Imagine how easy life would be if we had an owl who could help us build our nests. Yes, said another, and we could use it to look after our elderly and our young. It could give us advice and keep an eye out for the neighborhood cat, added a third. Then past us, the elder bird spoke. Let us send out scouts in all directions and try to find an abandoned owlet somewhere, or maybe an egg. A crow chick might also do, or a baby weasel. This could be the best thing that ever happened to us, at least since the opening of the pavilion of unlimited grain in yonder backyard. <laughs> the flock was exhilarated, and sparrows everywhere started chirping at the top of their lungs. Only Skronkfinkel, a one-eyed sparrow with a fretful temperament, was unconvinced of the wisdom of the endeavor. Quoth he, this will surely be our undoing. Should we not give some thought to the art of owl domestication and owl taming first? before we bring such a creature into our midst, replied Pastus, taming an owl sounds like an exceedingly difficult thing to do. It will be difficult to find an owl egg, so let us start there. After we have succeeded in raising an owl, then we can think about taking on this other challenge. There is a flaw in that plan, squeaked Skronk Finkel, but his protests were in vain as the flock had already lifted off to start implementing the directive set out by Pastus. Just two or three sparrows remained behind. Together they began to try to work out how owls might be tamed or domesticated. They soon realized that Pastus had been right. This was an exceedingly difficult challenge, especially in the absence of an actual owl to practice on. Nevertheless, they pressed on as best they could, constantly fearing that the flock might return with an owl egg before a solution to the control problem had been found. All right, what do you guys make of that? <laughs> it's well, not quite Plato, but <laughs> <laughs> it's heavy handed. But... <laughs> <laughs> a little on the nose. Um, I feel like this might have been more, uh, you know, mind blowing in 2014 when when it was written, I guess. But nowadays, it's just like, oh yeah, that's uh, that's what we're talking about all the time. Um, but I do think. Um, I do think this obviously gets at this question of, you know, should you ever, should you even go down this path at all, right? I think that's the core question uh, in develop, trying to develop AGI, or is it so risky that you should, you know, not do that at all unless you are 100% confident you've figured out how to tame the owl, right, in advance? Um, is that your guys reading as well? Yeah. Well, I think just to like rewind one second, I think coming back to this like AI kills us all point, I think there's two big questions in the sort of will AIs kill, kill us all narrative, right? Um, or maybe three, I guess. One will be, 
are we capable of developing an AI that's smarter than humans? Like two will be, if we're capable of developing an AI smarter than humans, would it want to kill us? And then three being, if it wants to kill us, can it figure out some way to kill us, basically, right? I mean, like, and I think those are all kind of three different questions, and maybe we all, like, agree on this podcast right. on, like, certain one or two or three or, or different elements of them. But, like, I think it's and helpful the, to, yeah, to break it down that way because those are all And if you do that, this, this yeah. story, the parable, the fable that I just read sort of assumes a couple of those, right? It assumes right, exactly. by using an owl, it assumes that such a thing could exist, right? And mm -hmm. that it it's a dangerous being that we actually need to figure out. In its essence, it's dangerous, and we need to figure out how to control it before we right. create it, right? And, so it sort of assumes into the story yeah. certain things exactly that you're framing up are open questions. I think they're open questions. I mean, in the parable, basically, the owl both is smarter and more powerful than the sparrows, uh, definitely wants to apparently kill or very likely potentially wants to kill the sparrows and certainly has the capability given that it's bigger and stronger or whatever, right? So to your point, it's sort of like, you know, the answer is kind of written into the story. Whereas I think in real life, like, I think, can we build AI smarter than us? Part one is actually a pretty interesting and contentious question. And then the other ones are also pretty interesting and contentious as well. But just to start on part one, like, do you guys think we can build an AI that's smarter than humans? I guess, like, let's be very specific about how we define sure. that, right? Because I <laughs> yeah. think it's a pretty critical very James question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, come on. <laughs> um, well, what's your definition of, I guess, smarter than humans? Is that a, are you saying super intelligence? We're talking sure. about Just saying an IQ that has never been achieved by a human, right? You know, I, I, I mean, think whatever. that, like, I think there's kind of this concept of AI, AGI, which is better at uh, i would say like the median human at you know most tasks and then there's super intelligence right which is you know better like better than the best humans at most tasks right mm -hmm. uh, is that how you yeah. guys think about it sure. as well yeah let's, let's so say better I, than the best humans at any mental task or any yeah. any relevant mental task right i guess i believe that this is going to happen uh i think you know it would be naive to say it, will, it won't happen so then it's just a matter of a question of like when it will happen um, and whether there are any kind of domains where it feels like it won't happen for a long time. Right. Like, are there, you know, any domains that we really think, you know, it's going to be take take much longer to achieve super intelligence um, than than other domains. Right. So maybe it will be the best coder in the world. But will it also be the best screenwriter? Are those things going to happen at the same time or are they going to happen you know, at different times? Yeah, I, I, I mean, first of all, you know, AI is smarter than the smartest humans in some domains right now. Already. Like mm -hmm. Chess, you, Go, well, you know, games well, but, particularly. Right, but that that is not a general intelligence. No, right? no, no, that I'm is, just saying just... Yeah, but in right. specific domains, it's better, I, yeah. I think it will continue to cleave off domains, right? I think like mm -hmm. sort of beat all humans at the LSAT type thing seems very soon. Yeah. I I think what feels far away is sort of, and it fits into the fears of an AGI is sort of the strategic planning and like what an AGI looks like that sets like broader priorities across. Like in a game, it's like you want to win at chess, like straightforward. But when it has to, you know, sort of solve general optimal outcomes like it feels like we're so far from a being that could do that or a computer that's interested in sort of deciding whether it should play chess or do something else and like why especially if we're not again just articulating what the goals are so i guess i'm not as bullish on a, in the next decade a mm. sort of coherent overall sort of being that feels like smarter than a human but i mean the next decade though i mean if we're already negotiating this down to the next decade, yeah. it would seem like you're pretty confident <laughs> that mean, it's going to happen. I in our like, lifetimes, like, I yeah. think it's going to happen. Okay. Yeah. So you think well, in our what, lifetimes that will happen? Yeah. All right. What about my, er, my earlier distinction, though, Eric? Do you, do you think, you know, an AGI that is a general intelligence that is basically better than the median human at most things is or or equal to is more likely to happen in the next decade? Is that five years? I just think it's hard to do it. I, we just don't see it as sort of a an overall agent or like an overall decision. You know what I mean? I, I see it like winning at a bunch of discrete tasks that you can okay. sort of assign. So this mm. kind of gets at more of like your definition of AGI 
potentially would require some sort of Turing test type thing that can really just convince you that it is a human or I guess I'm trying just, to think just of like, like an overall thinker with like sort of priorities and sort of but at right. the end of the day, like just to make any predictions about this, it has to kind of ha be a f falsifiable yeah, assertion yeah, yeah. of like, what is AGI, right? Um, and it's not that easy to to define that except by some sort of like test, right? Otherwise you end up in this like era or this pattern we were, we're always in that we are constantly moving the goalposts on like what AGI is, right? Right. 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 Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, I think you guys are both like, in the same place which I am, which is like, it's very hard to figure out the timeline, but like, to me, it's definitely happening sometime in the next 100 years, let's say, whether it's 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 it is a little bit harder to guess, but like, it is kind of a math problem, right, where we have brains that are just some giant collection of neurons, right, and there's, you know, millions and millions of them or whatever, whatever order of magnitude it is, right, and essentially we're training these large language models on, um, you know, a neural network in some ways, right? Which, I don't, you know, it's not a one-to-one -one, um, copy of what a neuron, how a neuron works in our brain, which is way more complicated. But fundamentally, you're sort of like, if I can just throw numbers at this problem of like building a brain essentially and like get more GPU cores, like just throw absolute, just computing power at this thing. Like the story of our entire lives has been computing power just keeps going up exponentially, right? You know, Moore's law or whatever, right? And so... To me, it seems like you'd have to believe there's something fundamentally different about the way a human brain works or a neuron works to the way, you know, a neural network or, or you know, the way a GPU uh, transformer model works to, to believe that we can't just throw numbers at this thing until it gets smarter than humans. Um, and so I guess I do believe that we throw enough numbers at it and get smarter than humans. Uh, I mean, humans as, have as to when. multiple sort of parts of the brain that developed in different ways that interact with each yeah. other. Yeah, but they're still sort of kind of built a, on the same cell dynamic. structure. I mean, yeah, yes, but but you could do that in an, in an AGI too, right? You could right. have different lobes or whatever of the imaginary intelligence, right? And, um, and then broadly, we just really don't understand how to pinpoint the experience of human consciousness, like qualia <laughs> or whatever. I talked about this at length with Reed Hoffman <laughs> when I interviewed him and like, so, but we're gonna, but we're very reluctant because we can experience our own consciousness to attribute it in animals, and we really have no like roadmap for how we to ever identify it in machines, and that's sort of different than the super intelligence thing. But it's certainly part of what you want in the sort of like does it have like a real existence sort of question, which I don't even yeah. have a roadmap for how we'd identify. But but coming back to the core topic of the episode, like, will AI kill us all? Like, it doesn't really matter if it's conscious or not, right? If it ends up having the power and the right. desire to kill us, right? Totally. Um, so, like, I do think that's an interesting question, and I don't know, maybe that's a different episode. But, like, it, to me, that's not that's not worth getting hung up on in the, like, is it going to kill us all thing? Like, Definitely. Yeah. Because, I yeah. mean, the, the sort of classic example being the paperclip maximizer, right? The machine, the fear that we just program this really smart, you know, LLM and tell it like, oh, your only objective is maximize paper clips, you know, and then it goes about it. And then it's like, well, the humans are <laughs> hurting sort of the maximization of paper clips. Let's get rid of them. I mean, famously, like iRobot um, by Asimov, it's like robots are supposed to protect humans, but then humans all kill each other. So it's like, oh, if we need to protect the humans, I sort of need to enslave them in order to ensure their protection. <laughs> you know? um, yeah. So, that doesn't it doesn't necessarily need to have the depth of thinking. You know, humans would see sort of the flawed what we would perceive to be flawed reasoning in those things, but it would still but a machine you could see why a machine with certain objectives could operate that. Well, way. I think it's sort of like saying that these artificial intelligences uh can have totally different orthogonal objectives that don't require a consciousness, right? Like they just for some reason develop a different objective than we have as humans um, and they're capable of like bringing about that objective to the detriment of humanity basically, right? Yeah, I mean, a nuclear weapon doesn't have consciousness but it's right. still very yeah. effective at killing right. people, right? right. Like, like that's its mission. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, so I, it seems like we all agree, okay, we're gonna achieve super intelligence some point in the next, let's say century or an intelligence that's smarter than humans in enough domains that it's it's meaningfully you know, more capable than we are, right? Yeah. Um, so the second question, like, you know, would it want to kill us? I think this is like one of the most interesting ones. And you alluded to the sort of 
paperclip maximization as one example of how it might just end up killing us as like a side effect of some other mission it's on, right? But um, I guess A, like how likely do we think that is? And then B, like, do we think that we'll be able to constrain its missions in some way so that it wants to keep us alive, um, you know, even if it's going off and executing its goal? I do actually, you know, worry about this, I guess, that um, the AI will have some orthogonal objective that is detrimental to humans. And then there's like a secondary question of like, can we do anything about that, right? <laughs> we were like, I mean, to read between what you're saying, you're like, if Anthropic and OpenAI are left only in charge, we'll be fine. But if Facebook's llama runs around, we're screwed. I mean, that's sort of, I mean, I'm interested to see what Mustafa, who's going to speak at Cerebral Valley, you know, he's been much more reticent about open source, potentially for um, this lack of control issue. I do think that eventually, if we start to see, you know, the risks, like that we all agree that, you know, this we're headed towards this super intelligence and we start to see how dangerous that may or may not be. Like, I just don't think we know yet how dangerous it will be. Uh, like it's obvious to me, like you want to maintain the ability to regulate this. And, uh, you know, just a lot of people, I think I saw Brian Armstrong from Coinbase, you know, tweet that he just thinks there should never be any AI reg regulation or I don't know if he said never, but he was basically like regulation has such a poor track record around innovation. Like, I just think that's sort of naive uh, without us knowing yet, like, how dangerous it can be or not. We just Whether need to have the best AI on our side, you know? Like, <laughs> when the killer one comes, we need to have the benevolent one. The best defense <laughs> against a bad guy with an AI is a yeah, good guy yeah, with right, an AI. Exactly. That's how, real, <laughs> like, that's how Americans actually <laughs> think, you know? like <laughs> The right to bear AI, baby. Yeah. That was kind of Sam Altman's perspective when he started OpenAI. Like, I mean, at least my reading of it when he was getting started was calling it OpenAI because he believed... You know, putting AI in the hands of humanity, uh, democratizing it was like the best way to go about things. And I think he's changed his mind because of this exact thing that I'm saying, which is like, it's actually pretty dangerous or potentially dangerous. The fact so, that OpenAI isn't open at all, I know, is like something yeah. that has been beaten to death, but it's just still ridiculous to me. It just that it's, it's a hilarious kind of uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, historical it's, artifact or yeah, something. Yeah, right. But I, I mean, I think, I guess, putting aside the regulation thing and the, yeah. the, the open source versus closed source thing, I just think that if you believe that a substantially diverse group of people from different countries within America, open source, closed source, can develop a super intelligence, right? Like, if you believe there's going to be more than, like, five of these, which I think there would be, like, in any scenario in which this actually happens, like, isn't it just very likely that one of the five or 10 or 100 or 1,000 of these is, is a bad AI? I mean, I just don't, I don't think it matters if you have 999 aligned good AI and one bad one, if that one bad one is capable of destroying the world, right? I mean, like, it again, I just, I just think that um, mathematically, if it's possible to create super intelligences, like someone is going to create a super intelligence that's really bad, right? And yeah. I'm not sure, like, our existing analogies around, like, guns or nuclear deterrence or whatever sort of game theory you want to play out here like apply where like if any one bad ai can get access to the tools it needs to kill everyone it will it will succeed right like i don't think all the good ai can stop it but but maybe i'm going too far out on this i mean i agree with it i think <laughs> so so your take is that obviously yes the answer is yes you know if we achieve super intelligence there's a pretty big risk to that existing I mean, in, in the world you would have to create some way for the good AI to regulate the bad AI, basically. Like, if you believe we're in a world where no longer humans are, they're not in the driver's seat, right? We're in the back seat, right? Like, you now have to basically try to figure out how to make sure that the AI that are in the front seat can control the other ones. <laughs> I mean, part of what Max is basically referencing, just, you know, to give a little context is Eliezer Yudikowsky. I mean, I pulled actually a quote, you know, to visualize a hostile superhuman AI, don't imagine a lifeless book smart thinker dwelling inside the internet and sending ill-intentioned emails, visualize an entire alien civilization thinking at millions of times human speeds, initially confined to computers in a world of creatures that are, from its perspective, very stupid and very slow. A sufficiently intelligent AI won't stay confined to computers for long. In today's world, you can email DNA strings to laboratories that will produce proteins on demand, allowing an AI initially confined to the internet to build artificial life forms or bootstrap straight to post-biological molecular manufacturing. I don't know. I, my point of view is just like, 
I think him and sort of what you guys are getting at, it just feels like you're like, oh, it's super intelligent. It's like godlike. You know, I, I still think, okay, it's way smarter than us. But we're like a bunch of intelligent beings, even if it's smarter than us. I, I mean, it requires that, that it, it's going to act stealthily and sort of like start manufacturing like a biologic version. You know, like I oh, just feel like okay. it's more likely that we're like this thing doesn't really listen to us. And like, but then like the GPU clusters are like, it's trying to fire them all. And it's just like, oh, there's only so much computing power that, you know, it's still a being that requires like resources, you know, like humans are smarter than everything else. We still die. Like there, there are just like physical limits to things and, and that it's not going to have like godlike powers. It's going to be limited by the amount of compute it can access and sort of our cooperation at various points. Like, I, I don't know. I don't think it's on zero to God. I feel like you're painting, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're painting a picture where we have created super intelligence and you agree with Max's point that some of them are misaligned and right. probably would want to kill us if they could. However, you're saying that the like humanity is, you know, fine because those misaligned AIs can't get enough resources. Is that accurate? Right. I mean, like. But I don't know. It's just it's hard to know, right? We don't we don't we, we don't know what is. <laughs> That's definitely a gamble. I mean, even if yeah. you believe that, you're like you're like, you're like <laughs> you've gone uh, you've gone pretty close to the edge. <laughs> well, I, I'm I'm definitely a fatalist on AI. Is my act. if we're getting to like our deep like what is our position? It just I just think like mo many people in tech, like the regulation is pretty bad and like gonna be only going to stop I, the good guys that this is going to keep going and that I'd rather the best people we have try to figure it out rather than like operate in the shadows. Yeah. I, just, I, I tend to agree with you and I probably would agree that we're not, we don't need a lot of regulation right now on, you know, uh, who can, you, you know, train these models or something like, but I, I also wouldn't rule out like needing this in the future if in a year from right. now or two oh, years yeah. from now, I start seeing, you know, a lot of like evidence that we've the open source community has created super intelligent, misaligned AI. Right. I, right. I, I think people yeah. are kind of, you know, going a little bit too far in the direction of saying this, you know, we don't need it. You need any regulation here when it's a new technology. We just don't know what it's going to be like. Uh, we we don't, you know, and it is a little bit like when we were, you know, putting the right to bear arms in the Constitution without knowing what arms meant in the future, right? Uh, right. Like how 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 dangerous they may or may not be. So I think that I'm just a little nervous about, you know, assuming too much about uh, whether we will need regulation in the future. I mean, to come back to Yudkowsky for a second, I mean, he is sort of the, the progenitor of this whole AI doomerism concept or whatever. I mean... I, read a bunch of his he essays seemed online. to almost like at yeah. one point threaten like blowing up <laughs> gpu right? like, yeah well yeah. he had a he had a time article that he was saying in his world of protecting uh humanity like one of the only things you would have to do would be to um you know protect you know prevent rogue data centers from training models and you know it'd be justifiable to like bomb them essentially right. and and he was saying you know the entire uh kind of geopolitical um, you know, consensus should be that it's worse to train these models at some level than it is to like right. worry about nuclear uh, pr proliferation. I think, I mean, I having read a bunch of his stuff, I feel like he has like pretty well convinced me of sort of all all three of these things. I guess that we'll have a super intelligence that it'll it'll be cap it'll it'll some of them at least will desire to harm us and that they'll figure out some way to do it. I guess I'm sort of like. I'm a little bit of a fatalist in the sense that I, I think this is basically an unstoppable train at this point that has like left the station. Like I don't I don't think bombing data centers is like a viable solution to this problem or breaking GPUs or whatever. Um, or certainly not in the like the human political universe that we actually operate in today. Um, I think my my attitude is just that like luckily I guess my the future is really hard to predict, right? I mean I know that's like a very obvious point, but if you had told someone in 1940 that we were going to invent nuclear bombs and they had really thought through all the, you know, the potential problems in the future caused by those devices, I think they could have been pretty fatalistic. And I think that would have been a pretty accurate read on like how bad it was that we invented nuclear bombs, right? Like 
knock on wood, so far we're still here. So my sort of my fear is that all the stuff right. you had Kowski says is going to happen. Nuclear bombs my, are yeah. good. Like that but, but, they have yeah. brought about like right. peace. We haven't had world yeah. wars, you know. But my uh, hope is that we get lucky and that something about this future that we're that Yudkowsky or the AI doomers are sketching out is is there's some missing link in the logical chain or or there's some piece of the way deterrence or or alignment or whatever ends up working that that we uh we get our ass saved but I'm kind of betting on luck at this point like I don't really I think mean, we're capable of stopping this like it just if we're all yeah, fatalists yeah. basically <laughs> I mean there is like the human cloning you know people brought this up to me like human cloning is an example where people have, you know, America isn't cloning humans. It seems like we could. Sure. Like, why Why is that an area could, where yeah. self-regulation seems much more possible? Hmm. I feel like there are know. areas I mean, where we have stopped. That's still pretty hard, right? I mean, like, I bet that will happen sometime in the next 50 to 100 years, right? I don't know. I just feel like, I don't know how much desire there is for that. But I, I feel like once it's doable, people will do it. My last thinking on one positive future scenario that I sort of believe is possible is like, you know, we live on this planet with lots of other organisms and creatures, as you guys described. You know, we have pets, we have dogs, whatever. Like, why do we have dogs? Like, is there any really good reason? Like, the question is, like, could we end up being the pets of the AI? Like, right. could, we, could they want to keep us alive for some reason and that we're a little bit different, we're a little bit interesting to them, more fun to have around in some scenarios, but, like, in the end, we're the AI's pets, you know? Or or maybe we're the ants and they just don't care to kill us all because it would be such a pain, you know, right? Um, like, I think that's more it, likely it, than like, not. Right. I think that is the the upside scenario is like we're we're pets or we're ants or well, something not, compared not, to not, this sorry, AI. More likely than yeah. not just the general like the AI does not hate us. You know what right. I mean? Like yeah. both we helped create it, like we set a lot of its initial value system presumably, like it yeah, you know and, relies us on us for a lot of things early on. Like I don't maybe, know, there are lots maybe, of reasons like, Yeah, maybe we're just different in some sort of interesting way, right? In that we're not we're not wired exactly the same and so, you know, it's it's just interesting to have us around because we act a little bit differently or or something like that. And um, AI is not like an evolutionary being. Like, you know, we are driven by these like evolutionary prerogatives that make us sort of true. Yeah. competitive and you know and <laughs> worried about other other sort of genetic codes. I, it, it's just such a separate type of thing. It's like hard to extrapolate from, I don't know, even beyond humans like animals to what an AI would be like. Okay, I so, so yeah. I guess we all agree we're all going to die <laughs> or right. be the AI's pets. But it seems like we, ha we haven't really narrowed in on how likely this is to occur in any meaningful time frame. Like I think that mm -hmm. to me is pretty interesting. You know, if this happens in 10 years or even 20 years or you know i think that's pretty different from how i might go ahead and live my life you know uh for the next decade i guess how about you guys like do you think it's even worth thinking about that you know right now and how you live your life or not really i don't know i don't know it's, it's, <laughs> I, just, yeah. I just i can't i can't decide like if i would I mean, make any just in different some decisions. ways i think yeah. you know being close to it is appealing and like you know this Having is a, a technology on. that I believe in, unlike crypto. So it's like, oh, run to where, you know, the actual interesting thing that could really revolutionize humanity is. Like, I I want to be around it, I guess, selfishly. So, you know, host an AI right. conference with you guys. Run, but, in, run, um, into the, run into the burning <laughs> building. <laughs> right. um, will AI, AI kill us all in some ways is great PR for the AI industry, even though it's sort of bleak, because... It suggests, it takes as a premise that artificial intelligence is at a really amazing point and super powerful and is poised to like be extremely disruptive. And so if you're an investor and you're like, well, I can't save the world, I will try to profit off of it. <laughs> In the good scenario, will AI kill us all is definitely a good motivator to like deploy capital into AI. Like, what do you take of the fact that sort of the doomerism is like great PR for the actual existing, you know, bill for vector database companies. It's a, it's a good message. You know, I don't know. What do you make of this that? Is, this is like war profiteering is the motiv no. motivation here. <laughs> no, like I'm just saying it's like, you know, the media loves it. Like Ezra Klein, they will, you know, talks about it all the time. But like in some ways it is a good, it's good marketing for the AI. It could be just like 
you know, a fairly mundane technology that we're nowhere close to the jump to AGI, like the Reed Hoffman interview, he's not, he's not willing to sort of commit to any near time horizon that, uh, that AGI is coming. It could just be like, it's a pr- fairly incremental technology. I, I think it's good fundraising pitch to say, yeah. Hey, like we're trying to prevent, you know, AI from killing us all. Like we're the good AI guys. Right. I mean or, like, yeah, yeah you're like, this is life it. or we're death. We're doing you know? this technology yeah. that, is yeah. so that is so powerful. Right? Powerful yeah. that so like, people are worried that it's going to kill yeah. us all. You know, okay. like, I mean, yeah. I, I feel like I, that's a good, like, you know, it's a, it's a I, conversation that's good for industry. Can Is there an Probably. analogy to another industry where you think that this has occurred? I'm just, I'm not as convinced, I guess. Like, is it great for the oil and gas industry right now that, you know, climate change is... Well, you could you know, argue, I'm, you know, like sometimes like um, when parents like freak out about like teen stuff that's obviously not that dangerous for them. That in some ways it like drives teens closer to it and that it's like, yeah, this is totally misunderstood by the sort of authorities like, but it, it reinforce it gets it in the news all the time. It reinforces that this is something that's sort of going on, you know, I mean, I think it's like pros and cons to your point. Like, I think it might drive a lot more regulation in a shorter time frame than yeah. what they would have otherwise. And to your other point, it will probably be kind of dumb regulation. So like, you <laughs> right, know, right. I don't know, you know, um, the European Union has made a terrible job of doing privacy regulations and just excited to see what they gin up for AI. <laughs> I mean, I think in, isn't Italy banned chat GPT right now? Right, or right, they've been, it's right, like, right, it's right, like right. already you're like, God, these <laughs> European regulators are just off the chain. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, so pros and cons, right? Uh, banned in Italy. Uh, maybe you can raise a couple hundred million dollars with a, with a slide deck at this point. So, you know, you get, yeah. you get both, I guess. I guess I, I don't know if I, if I was Sam Allman, like, would I want the level of AI doomerism occurring right now to continue? Probably not. Probably not. I, to be clear, just my actual position is that like it, things are very exciting right now. That mm-hmm. this is a legitimate question. That will AI has kill us all is legitimately grounded in like all you know sci-fi content and thought experiments about where this is going. So I don't think it's made up, but I think a happy coincidence is that this sort of question is fundamentally good PR. That's all I'm saying. So I think one interesting topic is AI and sci-fi, right? Obviously. A number of the most successful films, you know, TV shows, books, everything in history have been built around sci-fi, which often is driven by this idea that there's an evil killer AI, basically, right? And I think the examples that come to the top of my mind, and you guys might have other ones, are like, you know, The Matrix, you know, iRobot, as you mentioned, the Terminator series, um, Blade Runner, Blade Runner, I, you know, her being a sort of off-kilter example, but still important, I think. Um, And what's interesting is almost all of these ones, other than her that I mentioned, it involves robots as well as AI, right? It's it's like the humanoid version of the AI is essential to you know killing us all, right? We're we're in Terminator. There's the good storytelling. Yeah, Yeah, right. Well, yeah, it might just be more cinematic to fight a big metal robot, so you know that's something. But um, I guess, and then in her, you sort of have this Scarlett Johansson AI that at the end kind of ascends to a higher plane and like leaves leaves uh, the main character Joaquin Phoenix behind, right? Um, and I think that I to me that representation seems more likely than the killer robots one and that the as I said, maybe we're just pets and they just sort of get bored with us and, and leave us behind or, or we're the little, you know, dogs that they leave alive, right? But I guess what do you guys think about, well, A, what's your favorite sci-fi representation? Uh, and then B, do you think robots are an essential part to these AI kill us all narratives or, and, or will the robot elements integrated with AI happen anytime soon? Well, I, I, I can answer with my favorite. I mean, I think okay, my yeah. the matrix, matrix is, is great, my favorite. Obviously, and I was going to say the matrix. That's what yeah. <laughs> the matrix t- buys into exactly what you're saying. The matrix doesn't actually say it's killer robots. It, it finds a way to basically put killer robots on the screen. So it's a fun movie, but yeah, it's like, Oh, it's a computer program, which is obviously the world. I feel like a super intelligence would live in like that of what <laughs> does it really need to manifest in the real world that yeah. much? So, yeah, I, I'm scout and obviously I'm interested, you know, for the following conversation with somebody who's written a lot about robot apocalypse, because, yeah, my intuition is that they're going to exist mostly, mostly in the digital world. Terminator 2 is the other one where like 
I think the robot part is interesting, but I don't know how much you remember about the the historical world building of of the AI takeover, which is Skynet is is an AI that achieves super intelligence that then takes over the nuclear arsenal of the United States or and then bombs Russia or whatever, and then we end up in nuclear apocalypse, basically, right? So the initial manifestation of the AI apocalypse in, in Terminator and Terminator 2 is is a purely software driven death scenario, right? There's no there's no need for robots in the sort of Skynet backstory, right? Um, it can hack into a system that ends up destroying the world, which like I find quite realistic, right? Because then you don't need any physical right. elements, right, of, of this sort of AI doomer narrative, right? You don't need the robots. You don't need the, the crazy biohacking stuff or whatever. You just need to hack into the Pentagon, essentially, and it's like game over at that point, right? right. So um, I always thought that was a very insightful perspective on how an evil AI could kill us all and that it would just be a pure software takeover. Right. James, did you have a favorite? Well, I, I wanted to dig into the Matrix a little bit uh, more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think, you know, a lot rests on whether we think that's humanity's future as well. Like, are we going to be like almost, you know, um, by choice plugging ourselves into the Matrix? Like, is, is this Neuralink kind of interface you know, within that 50 to 100 year time frame or, or even sooner, right? Uh, you know, does does our normal day to day life as humans, you know, become more um, of a simulation, you know, in, in, in our lifetimes? I think that's pretty interesting uh, for how the future unfolds. Um, so do you guys believe that is possible? Like or do you think, you know, brain interfaces are sort of so far away? I think and, brain interfaces 30 plus 30 plus years, 30 plus years so away. Yeah, I kind of agree. Yeah. I mean, I think it's possible maybe in our lifetime, which, you know, God willing is 50 to 60 more years, but it does seem like we're pretty far away on neural interfaces. But, you know, who knows? I feel like yeah. I'm, I, I'm more excited to come back to the previous episode about like glasses and maybe contact lenses at some point as a sort of, you know, augmented interface for, for existence rather than like plugging in. But you never know. I mean... Obviously, Elon believes in it. So Elon believes like this is the path right out of the AI doomerism uh, that we've all, that we've been talking about. That we are about, augmented, that basically. We sort of merge our brains, yeah, with with AIs, and that probably requires some sort of uh, brain interface or you know matrix like environment that you're living in. Um, seems I don't hard see to believe. How that I agree. I'm not. I'm not very problems or like the. <laughs> you you think that that basically is not sufficient to. Prevent. I just don't think it answers much the like, will it kill us? Like, oh, it's like yielding our brains to it almost means like, are we even running the show? Like it, it raises a whole bunch of other questions where we could be undermined just yeah. from the connection independent. Like it's true. Yeah. Yeah. And it also, it also like pretty quickly, if you believe in super intelligence kind of defeats the purpose of having that brain uh, yeah. power like why why do you need, yeah why would why, why would they want to be hanging out in our right. brains it's right. like it's like oh cool i've got this brain that's not as good as mine like, well maybe consciousness is this yeah. unique human charm that nobody else has and we can give the machines a taste of it i don't know nah, um it, just succinctly do you think in the next hundred years ai will kill us all yes or no hmm hmm I will say no. I think it will kill some of us, but not all of us. That's a good way to think. That's about. a good. Yeah, I, I think like more <laughs> than a thousand, less than ten thousand. Oh, more. I don't know. I think more. That's than, a very tight than, range. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think, that's not I, a good I, range. I, I, think, I, I think I was smart to give it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some of us. Well, you came up with some of us. Some of us is the right. Some like, of clearly, us. Clearly, it feels like even a mistake. Yes. I will AI intentionally. Well, it was kill us all. Um, yeah. I say definitely no kill us all. That's I say definitely There'll no kill us all. There will still be some humans at the end. I, really. I can't say definitely. I mean, it, yeah, it seems pretty un, you know, un, well, uncertain. Well, if, if we do all get killed, we'll be dead, and so there's nothing to gain from the prediction. Whereas sure. if we live, I was correct, and so was a, you, <laughs> yeah. there was good utility in the prediction. So I don't know why I would ever go the other direction. This is like Pascal's <laughs> wager with like super intelligent AI. Like, <laughs> All right. This was fun. I mean, this is 
This is the dream, getting to hang out and talk about this and call it work. Welcome. Hey, welcome to the second segment here. I've got author Daniel H. Wilson, uh, author of How to Survive a Robot Uprising, Where's My Jetpack, How to Build a Robot Army, and Robopocalypse. Uh, the title of this, or at least the working title of this episode is Will AI Kill Us All? So given... Uh, your interest and and work. We wanted to talk with someone who's really like been thinking about this uh, for a long time. I'm I'm curious, like what what first got you interest in this sort of dystopian question of sort of the machines coming for humanity? Yeah, well, so I just grew up with science fiction, right? Like like a lot of people. So uh, initially, I was just interested in reading you know any type of science fiction i could read or watch in any type of movie i just loved robots and so right uh that's ultimately though i loved robots so much that i studied robotics so i ended up uh, going to carnegie mellon i did a, a whole phd in robotics and while i was at carnegie mellon you know i'm surrounded by roboticists i'm surrounded by robots we're in uh the high bay we're, we're just in the lab and nobody was really trying to build robots that would uh, destroy the world, I noticed. Right. No, <laughs> was nobody like this... says they're trying, generally. Yeah, nobody like... comes out and says it. Right. But, like, there's this really stark difference between how robots are portrayed in pop culture and how they're, and, and, and the actual, you know, uh, the actual mechanics of building robots and why people are building them and how they're explaining, you know, why they need the money to build them and all right. that. And so... Really, they just have this super bad, you know, reputation, right? And so um, I thought that was funny. Um, so then when I was still in grad school, I wrote How to Survive a Robot Uprising, where I was just like, all right, I'm going to take them serious, right? Right. Just, okay, fine. If this is what everyone's expecting. So I went to, you know, the people that were building legs, and I asked, you know, how would you trip a robot? How would you get away? Um, right. I went to the people doing sensors, the people doing all different things. And I just asked those questions and I put it all, you know, tongue in cheek into this book. Um, of course, then you start to look at like actual military applications. You start to right. see how robotics and AI are, are, you know, being weaponized in some cases. And then, um, you know, that was more robopocalypse. Much, <laughs> no tongue in cheek. Like, right. I, I was like, okay, let's, You're let's really to consider believe. it. You're like, okay, this I... <laughs> No, I never really, I mean, honestly, I like, I like, uh, the killer robot meme really, for me, just gives you a lot of latitude to 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 think it's about good story humanity telling. and think right. about you know what makes us people, what makes them robots, you know. Um, do stuff do like you that. do you think like as a person and somebody, do you think robots are likely to kill human beings or like do you see this no. as a fictional exercise? No. Yeah. I, well, it's, look, I, I I kind of ascribe to the uh, lately I've been thinking a lot about something called the psychotic ape theory or the, mm. the killer ape theory which is think about the opening scenes of like space odyssey 2000 uh 2001 like yeah it's those the you know they touch the the monolith it gives them a leap forward in evolution and what do the apes do well they figure out how to use weapons to bash each other's brains in and there, right. there's this kind of notion that humanity sort of uh evolves technologically when we're trying to kill each other or stop each other from killing each other you know and so um so yeah, so I've been thinking a lot about that, and and basically you look at that and you realize we will use any technology to kill each other. Right. And so really, it's the psychotic ape that you need to worry about. Um, it's yeah. not the, and to a lesser extent, the you know the capitalist ape. Right. The known <laughs> but, uh, killer species versus the sort of imagined killer. Yeah. Who's yeah. killed more people than anybody right. else? Right. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> uh, you're gonna want to look at the yeah the person uh, across the table from you, but. I think that in terms of being used as weapons, you know, obviously robots can be extremely uh, dangerous in that way. I mean, I'm curious sort of, you know, as a technologist, somebody who's thought about this, like robots versus like the large language model sort of totally software based being that maybe reaches super intelligence. Like I, I see why for like, especially film, why like robots are great because you can see them. I'm curious in terms of like the actual like thought exercise and what you think is likely whether you imagine robots or the sort of potential threat being just a software type yeah. being. Well, so I think of this as like a consumer, like a like a product design issue, right? Like, mm. uh, you know, I mean, look, we're human beings are comfortable with a certain amount of risk in our lives. You know, for what, 40,000 people 
get killed uh, driving around in cars, you know, every year. Right. I've got a garbage disposal in my kitchen. I mean, if I put my hand in the wrong place in my own home, like I won't have a hand anymore, right? But uh, so, but there's also the devices are built in order to try to make them as safe as possible, right? So if you think of that as a hardware problem, on the hardware side, you know, you're trying to design a consumer product that's not going to harm people. And that's just, the, I mean, we, people do that every day, right? We've been doing that for years and years. It's, it's a really under, well understood kind of task. And I think if you're building hardware, it's an easier task. Hmm. Because then when you move to software, it becomes much more complex, right? In terms of what the harm might be. So for instance, right now, I live in Portland, Oregon. Yep. And uh, in Seattle, uh, up the road there, they are, the, the school system is suing like Meta, right? Because uh, they have documented harm that using the social media has harmed children. It's like right. the Philip Morris thing again, right? I mean, they know for a fact using this product causes harm to children. They die. They commit suicide. So uh, if you identify that, I mean, that, that takes a little while to put those, to connect those dots, right? right? It's not the same as if they were just selling toasters that were electrocuting people. Like, you understand pretty clearly, like, okay, where's the danger there? Right. I mean, you can see if a robot is causing physical violence against exactly. a human. Or, right. And so here's where it gets, like, even more complicated, right? So, so let's say, by the way, we've got chatbots, purely software. Yes, they're going to, people are going to get led down crazy rabbit holes by these things. And there's going to be, I predict, extremely harmful scenarios occurring from people just being told whatever they want to hear and, and eventually being potentially radicalized or whatever, causing harm in the community. It won't be the robot doing it directly, but it, but it, or the, sorry, the chat bot or the large language model. But then you think about the synthesis of these two things as well. So like, think about uh, like a, a self-driving car. So now, I mean, it gets really complicated because you've got brains and you've got the hardware and so the question becomes like, okay, the car crashed. Like, whose fault right. is that? And so right now, that's something we're working out, you know, in the court systems. And, and we're using all of our existing machinery of our society to try to sort that out and right. figure that out. Um, so, you know, I, I would say those are really the three areas, you know, pure software, the hybrid, and then just the purely right. mechanical problem. of, of a... To have, like, a robo-apocalypse or, like, to have robots, like... A... It requires like a, the idea that there's some like super intelligence, right? I mean, all of that that's predicated on the idea. Yeah, in pop that, like, culture, a, you gotta have right. a singularity before. Right. I mean, that's just kind of like ticking the box, right? I don't right. know how realistic that is, but right. Well, that's I guess to me, like the, you know, I know it's fiction, but like, yeah, it just feels like if we have the super intelligence, is isn't that a threat enough without it taking? Yeah. sort of robotic form, or I guess yeah. is a particular question. You know, there's all these predictions about when the singularity is going to happen and how it's going to be exponential, so it's going to go slow and then happen fast. And, right. and like, it's really interesting because, you know, I was I have a degree in machine learning. I mean, I was studying it before they were calling it machine learning, like when it, it was called knowledge discovery and data mining and all these right. different. And so you, you look at that and what was happening early on was there were all these different approaches to, to trying to mimic intelligence, right? Right. Um, and we would use a whole suite of these things. And what happened was neural networks in the last few years jumped out ahead. And I would argue, although I'm sure other people would argue with me, but I would argue there was no amazing scientific breakthrough, right? What happened was processors got faster and we had access to just a ton of data. And so that data and those processors just are brute forcing what are fairly simple algorithms that have been well known for a long time. And they're getting this kind of uh, intelligent-ish behavior out of it. Right. And so that model isn't really, doesn't really sync up with the way I think people thought AI was gonna go, right? We didn't think, oh, we're just going to use some old algorithm and just throw more processing power right. at it until it gets good. Like, There's more um, GPUs, we're going to get it, yeah. <laughs> and so I don't know if it's... So what I'm trying to say is, if you look at that and we just... I mean, the way to improve chatbots, I guess, is to keep throwing more data and keep throwing more processing power. But I don't feel like there's any type of singularity that's going to come out of that. You I don't feel think like it's, it's a, like, oh, yeah, it's just going to be like better chat GBT. 
Yeah, or yeah, it'll just be like a more convincing chat GPT. It's just really, I, I mean, it's just really just regurgitating everything that it's, you know, in a very smart way that it's read on the internet, which by the way, I mean, God, that's the worst of humanity, right? I mean, <laughs> what's it got? It's trained on, I know, by the way. Right, I they're all desperate to train it off Reddit, for instance, yeah. <laughs> yeah oh my God. Um, right. You know, Reddit can be okay, but there's yeah, smart I mean, I like people Reddit, there. Reddit, but Reddit. yeah, it, but you're looking at the internet and it's right, like, right. oh Lord. But but anyway, I don't really, me personally, I don't see that. I see that as a kind of a dead end. I don't feel okay. like that's headed toward the singularity yeah. necessarily. Yeah, is there an existing dystopian work that you find most plausible or like what i mean I, you know there's yeah. so you know i've we talked there's the matrix there's sort of the terminator movies like i don't know like yeah i'm sure you've spent a lot of time in that world like are, sure. is there one that you find like oh this this is the most sort of real world well i mean i don't think that the purpose of science fiction is right. to predict the future yeah. necessarily but um i would say you know if you're thinking about I think the most boring stuff is actually the most realistic. Um, and like in, in a books. lot of ways. Look for the bad books. That no, I mean, <laughs> no, actually, that's not true. Like, uh, for instance, I would say Terminator, which is obviously great. Uh, right. But think about that villain. Think about Skynet. Skynet's just a dumb, dumb computer program that just has decided whatever it wants to destroy all humans. I mean, and there's no reason for it. There's no, it's just like, it just wants to kill everybody. I mean, that is so boring. You couldn't get away with an actual human antagonist right. who is that simple. People would be like, well, why? Like, what? Right. <laughs> um, and so, like, if you think of that as its end goal, that's not very super intelligent, is it? Right. Kill all humans. I right. mean, that's like bender level right there. Right. So um, <laughs> uh, I would say that, you know, that in a lot of ways is fairly realistic. If somebody just programmed a computer to tell it just super simple boring goal like that right um kill everybody like then um you know i feel like that's fairly realistic I, to step away from the uh yeah dystopian question for a second i'm curious just like as an author one like are you using chat gpt at all like in any way or yeah. any other sort of llm tools well so first of all i all of my novels are in the training data, which means hopefully I'll be part of a lawsuit. So yeah, I know. I was going to gonna ask you about that next. Okay, I asked, gonna... <laughs> I went into chat GPT and I said, Hey, write me a short story in the, in the vein of Daniel H. Wilson. And it like immediately wrote, I didn't say anything else. And it right. immediately wrote about robots, right? It wrote, oh, yeah, it wrote science fiction. Right. It was really clear that it had been trained on my stuff. Right. I'm like, well, that's bullshit. First of all, right. Uh, I never gave anybody permission to do that. Right. Um, and so second of all, like I, I think it's so funny. So I had, uh, I'm not going to name the corporation because I don't want to get into trouble. But I had a large, large corporation approach me before ChatGPT, before OpenAI released, or before the, the, these GANs became like a big deal. Um, right. So this is maybe probably six months to a year before everybody knew about that and that that came out. And OpenAI really just broke the whole deal. Uh, and they, it was a researcher that called me. And they wanted to know if I would test out this new program that they had that was basically ChatGPT. And, and they said, uh, we want you to use it to help you write. And I'm right. like, okay, so then what, how will it help me write? And they say, well, and, and these are just such sweet researchers that don't have <laughs> any GD idea about what the real world is, is hell is going on in the real world. Right. Uh, and they're like, it'll help you be creative. And I'm like, oh, creativity. Right. That thing I hate doing. Right. That thing that I spent the last like 20 the years best part of my job. Yeah. Teaching myself right, right. to take what's in right. my head and put it right. in the world right. by memorizing all these really boring writing skills, which are just pure hell. <laughs> and then they want to come in and take the one good thing. I'm like, why do you think writers write? Right. <laughs> you think because we love typing? We like <laughs> pushing letters? I'm right. like, what the hell are you talking about? I was like, you need to be prepared for everyone that you give this tool to, to give you super negative feedback because right. they wanted to include me in like this report about how this tool would be used. And they wanted to publicize this report as well. And so uh, they, they went back and they came back and they said, Hey, we got great news. I got permission from like the program manager on this to include your uh, feedback, even if it's negative. 
And I was like, you know what? I'm going to just take a pass on right. this. I wish yeah. you luck with your project. Um, right. So, so man, no. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I think about, man? The thing that cracks me up is I used to really hate on uh, uh, Asimov because I was like, robot psychologists? What kind of bullshit is that? Like, you program robots, right? I spent all this right. time, you know, programming and learning all of these programming languages and and everything you got to do in order to in order to speak to the robot mind because it doesn't speak right. English, right? And I used to think that the idea of a robot psychologist was the dumbest thing ever. The idea of a positronic brain, by the way, which is made fully, it's just boom, it's done, it's crystallized. You can't go back and change it, right? And that's and and by the way, that's exactly what happens. So neural networks are black boxes. Right. You can't go in and fiddle with it because all the right. weights make no sense. Like the human and, brain, so it becomes like psychology. Yeah. And then now, if you want to, for instance, yeah, if you want to game a uh, um, like a mo like a chatbot, if you want to trick it into doing something, you totally have to use psychological right. things. Right. It's totally psychology. I mean, bravo, Asimov. <laughs> bravo, sir. Oh. Are you, do you think you will like try to sue? Like if somebody comes to you and says, oh, we're going to sue these guys for. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. No, that this has to happen. Right. Um, look, I mean, I, I get uh, people trying to make money. I get, you know, capitalism. I understand it. And uh, this is a case where, you know, they're, they're, they have to be sued. I mean, we're just, because we're creating new, this is a completely new domain. Right. And it's not okay to rip people off and then chop up their stuff right. and, and train an algorithm. And so our country or whatever <laughs> is going to have to figure that out and get that down in law. And that's going to require, yeah, courts. I mean, so absolutely, they're all going to get sued. Do you, do you think sci-fi and dystopias are bad for AI? Like even talking to ChatGPT, yeah. it's funny when you ask it to imagine things. It's been trained it, it, on all it, that. Exactly. It parrots all that. And so it can sound really spooky. Like yeah. it feels like, you know, you're like, I'm, you know, this is imagination. It's fiction. Like, but I do think people, you know, seriously turn to science fiction when they try and game out where sort of a technology we don't really understand that's developed faster than we expect uh, is progressing. So yeah. Is it is that bad in some ways? Do you do you regret I think, it? <laughs> uh, I think it says a lot more about us than it does about them, the, them yeah. being the robots. Um, right. You know, like uh, what I've been thinking about lately. So I don't know, know if you've read my books, but I, I'm from Oklahoma. I'm, I grew up in the Cherokee Nation. I'm a Cherokee citizen. And I write a lot. There's a lot of native characters in the stuff I do. Yeah. And so I think a lot about technology from like a native perspective. And one thing I've been thinking a lot about lately is just kind of like how a lot of this super negative like robots and also first contact like aliens, they always show up. And what do they do, man? They do exactly what all the colonizer civilizations did to indigenous people all over the world. So we got a civilization. Right. We got a society, a culture. It's all built on colonization, right? So it means a bunch of people with superior technology showed up someplace, murdered everyone, destroyed their culture. Uh, I mean, Independence Day, they're blowing up right. monuments. Right. What do you think that is? Like right. uh, resource extraction, right? They're st they're, what are they, stealing our water? They're stealing our air? The and then just completely dominating other people's bodies. You know, you think about invasion of the body snatchers and just like, so that type of fear, I think is cooked into our civilization based on our origins. And it comes seeping out into our pop culture in a lot of different ways. But uh, in particular, in science fiction, we see it so much. Do you, do you think we should stop? You know, there are even there are AI companies that say, oh, we should pause for six months. I mean, originally, it sounded like you were saying you didn't think just adding more, you know, compute was going to, like, create this super intelligence. But, do you, yeah, do you, do you have the impulse that, you know, we should slow down or stop this um, research if we don't know what's going to happen? Yeah, well, I don't think that that's what they're afraid of. I don't think they're afraid of us crossing the singularity threshold or something. I mean, yeah. they're just worried about... So, for instance, I... Yeah, I will tell you that uh, the, B the U.S. military is actively doing a lot of threat scenarios that involve this kind of technology being weaponized, the sort of disinformation on a mass scale, right? Uh, like hugely distracting events that could right. occur. I mean, at this point, I mean, you could get... 
you could get a phone call from someone. It could be just like in Robopocalypse, you know, where everybody gets a phone call from somebody that they're related to and they trust and they all get told to go to a right. certain it right. is a bad, bad situation. Right. I mean, all that stuff is starting to to be uh, right. You know, I really focus on possible. this idea of it acting independently, but obviously, just like bad people are. No, this is power. always going right. to be bad people. Right. And, and right. so, so first of all, I don't think that's they're not worried about that singularity. They're worried about this being weaponized. And in terms of putting a pause on it, I mean, yeah, I mean, why not? I, I would say only put a pause on it until we figure out the the rules around it. But but the fact is this: like that's not how the United States works. Like right. we don't fix anything until it's broken, right? I mean, there's not. I, I just don't have a lot of confidence that they're going to say, "Okay, six month pause, and we're going to work out all the laws, and everything's going right. to be all ready to go in six months." Like hell no, that's not going to work. So I mean, I think it's a great, a nice idea, but I I'm extremely dubious and skeptical that it could ever have any yeah. actual, you know, useful. Yeah. I mean, in other countries, they're still going to work. I mean, there's the, you know, sort of China boogeyman where it's like, you can't stop the whole world from working on it. And so there's the that. State, right. Honestly, though, there's the, there's the, the other side of that coin, which is, you know, thank God that they're actually interested in privacy in Europe, right? Like, at right. least there's some people standing up and saying, hey, like, we don't just have to accept this status quo just because you're a giant billion dollar corporation or billion trillion dollar corporation. Does you just something you referenced earlier does the military come to you to help game out sort of technological yeah i've done a little bit of that <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty fun so and i'm not the scary. only one who's like oh we should like uh get, get some guy who thought about it sort of fiction <laughs> in fiction to sort of say what well, would happen in the real world yeah i'm not the only one but there are there are and and honestly they're training their own um they're training their own science fiction writer i will oh. tell you this like if you are, uh, if you're a general in the Air Force or, or whatever, if you're some kind of higher up in the military, you get a lot of white papers that are describing the technological capabilities of the enemy or, or, or of various munitions and things like that. And these right. papers are very dry and just like very, you know, it's much better, I think, at least it's useful to have somebody actually creatively tell a story that's going to stick with you because that's right. the way humans communicate right through stories and uh then you and then the general is sitting there thinking okay now i've i've just read a story about a, you know an actual person being impacted by this technology in that way and you can really visualize what it means right and it's more than just facts and figures when you say they're the military is trained science fiction writers you mean those authors of the boring white papers or you mean like true um, science fiction writers? No, I mean that they they literally, you can, um, yeah, if you're in the military, you can, there are certain programs you can sort of sign up for where you get taught, yeah, where you get, they bring in science fiction authors to to help teach the, uh, the, the military people how to sort of, uh, yeah, take those super real world scenarios and write them in an engaging way so that you have sort of a case study and you say, look, yeah. here's one way this could be employed. Right. And that's just good. That's just good science fiction writing. Right. That's all that is. But they would prefer not to uh, outsource it to you know uh, hippies like me. Right. <laughs> like, uh, I'm curious how much sort of the technological developments we're seeing right now, like you know, Mid Journey, whatever, are influencing what you plan to write, or do you think like science fiction will change based on what we see is possible? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Is this changing? science fiction every day for sure and 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 look i think it was a watershed moment like whenever you really just finally just talk to it and you realize oh this thing is like yeah this thing can just talk to me and by the way right now there's this huge rush as you know like to plug this stuff in anywhere you can it's like oh i don't know what is it it's like it's like mayonnaise you know they're just putting it on we just discovered this thing let's put it on everything right <laughs> right and right, it's, right. You know, it's, it's a gonna, desperation yeah, yeah yeah it's gonna taste like crap on a lot of stuff <laughs> but like it's right. gonna work out in some places one thing i see which i find interesting is uh it, 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 it occupying as almost a homunculus right you think of a homunculus like a little tiny person that's inside of you kind of driving you around or you think of like who's the bad guy from spongebob you know <laughs> He's always driving a giant robot, right? Oh. The little guy. So if you think of the uh, chat GPT and you have like a, it's like the homunculus, you stick it inside of a hardware platform. So you can just tell chat GPT, here's a super simple programming language that allows you to 
drive around this uh, autonomous vehicle or allows you to uh, drive around this humanoid robot platform. And then you tell it in English, hey, go make a sandwich. And then it looks at all of its little controls and it translates that and says, okay, I'm gonna drive this thing in there. Cause it kind of get, has the right idea about what making a sandwich is. But, a, but a, a hardware platform is just a bunch of like X, Y, Z coordinates where you're gonna put your limbs. And, it's, and that translation right there, that's a spot where, where ChatGPT is kind of getting just like plastered in, you know, just slap mm. it in there and it solves all those problems. And so that's kind of interesting because now you're going to see ChatGPT having the ability to interact with the real world right. via like whatever delivery uh, bots or like or drones or, or humanoid robots. Um, and so that's where you maybe get into a little bit of consumer trouble. Again, it's like an autonomous car. Right. Is there anything you've written where, based on how technology has developed, you feel like, oh, it feels less plausible than when I wrote it? Or like, uh, how much like forecasting where, where what's possible do you see as like part of your writing? Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, what happens is you look at what's out there in the world and you run with it. You start thinking of all right. the different ways it could be. And that's where science fiction is fun, right? Because you suddenly you're like, oh, I never really thought of it like that, but but there it is. And dystopias are fun too, because, you know, it's dangerous, it's exciting. Um, and so w the difference between my writing and, and is that I had this degree in robotics. I all my friends from when I was 20, <laughs> they're all running corporate robot corporations. They're driving <laughs> the Mars rovers. Right. Like that. Interesting. So that, <laughs> my cohort, you know, I'm like my, all my old friends, that's what they're doing. And so I feel like I have a little bit of a sneak peek. So like, right. for instance, when I wrote Robopocalypse, that was 10 years ago or whatever. And it, I was watching and seeing the technology that was five or 10 years out. Right. So it's all come true. In fact, that's the joke because it's still, Robopocalypse is still with Spielberg at Amblin right. and, and, you know, development <laughs> continues on this movie. But like what we've, what we told Spielberg is, hey man, let's do this before it becomes a historical documentary. Like right. All of this stuff is... You know, the, so in, in Robopocalypse, there are, and Robogenesis, the sequel, which came out a few years later, there are autonomous vehicles. There is essentially chat GPT as, as personal assistance on phones. I mean, I wrote that before, before Siri came out. Hmm. Wow. It was 2011. Uh, the book came out in like 2011 or something. A long time ago. But uh, anyway, so yeah, I mean... My latest novel is The Andromeda Evolution, which is a sequel to Michael Crichton's The Andromeda Strain, which I, he passed away. And I did this with, in right. cooperation yeah. with, his, uh, with his estate. And, and, you know, that one was, again, like very dialed in in terms of just because it's Crichton, the, the government, like exactly which scientists would be going where, how they'd mm. be chosen. And, and uh, I mean, just so, so locking in those details is, is really important for a, for a techno thriller, you know, that certain genre of science fiction. Do you, do you give in sort of, uh, yeah, the professional need to be forward looking, do you have any sort of predictions or about where like culture is going or what, what you think, what you really think will be the more s sort of essential change? Like it, I mean, it does feel like, you know, like self-driving cars and stuff like that. Feel, yeah. feel close, certainly, in San Francisco. I mean, I think culturally, uh, human beings are always the wild card. The technology right. is not that hard to predict, usually. <laughs> I mean, you can usually see what people are up to five, ten years out. You, you know what, what they're going for, right? right? But then with human beings, you never know. Like, autonomous vehicles, I was much more sort of bullish on that. I thought those things would already be here, uh, being used in a bigger way. But, as it turns out, one person gets killed and humans freak out, even though 40 or 50,000 people are dying right. every year with inhuman human. But then the robot screws up once and everybody loses their mind and they shut them all down. It's like, I didn't really predict that. I thought we right. had a higher tolerance for, for that or, or le we cared less. Uh, right. So like, so it's really tough to predict the human element. And I think that with ChatGPT, man, things can go a lot of different ways, right? Uh, the movie Her is interesting. Right. Um, in terms of falling in love with it, I think that's totally going to happen. It can, it just tells us what we want to hear, right? And so I think that that is just so dangerous and just such a siren song. Um, for instance, the researcher who thought that 
that his, that the Lambda chat GPT, at Google, yeah. Blake, something, yeah. Yeah, he thought that that program was um, sentient. And did you just, I mean, when you read those transcripts, you can just see he's leading it, he's telling it what he wants to hear, and it every right. and he's rewarding it every time it comes back right. and tells him a version of what he wants to hear. It's almost like he said, write me a short story where you're a sentient AI. Right. And right. it has read all those stories. I know that it's read mine. And so like, uh, you know, it's going to jam those things out. And so, I mean, think about that, right? Like if you're just sitting and you've got sort of mass disinformation campaigns that are amplifying certain ideas, I mean, man, the, the, the potential for divisiveness, uh, I think is just super scary. And in fact, that's right. probably the biggest thing I'm afraid of is that we just end up in these crazy echo chambers. Um, like it just becomes a very effective propaganda tool or, you know, becomes, yeah, man, really good. at just, uh, and, and the, and the, and the thing that makes it so dangerous is that it's a mass scale individualized attack. So normally right. when you scale up to a mass level, you get a one size fits all type scenario, right? You know, it's not that effective in this case, man, you can scale it all the way. And then it's going to be individualized for each person. Right. And it's like, that's pretty crazy. That's pretty scary. I mean, the best case scenario of that is just we end up buying a bunch of shit we don't need because we're being <laughs> advertised to. That's the best case we, scenario. We get much better. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like advanced micro-targeting. I mean, you know, exactly with elections, right? It used to be like, well, at least you had to use the same message for everybody. And then right. it was like, okay, we can break it down. And then, you know, with Facebook, you know, obviously, yeah, there were these... The micro-targeting, what you're saying is now it's even easier to actually create the content for the sort of niche. And, and the thing is, it's very human-like, right? right? So one thing that I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm not, I, after, during COVID, right, we all got very used to interacting with machines. And, it, and everything that used to have a human element to it, they're trying to get that out, right? So it's a service. You want it. I give you the money. You give me the thing. No chit-chat. And I need it now. <laughs> And I don't want any bull, right? And so right. we did that. We were doing that online. And we we're doing that also with lifelike machines that are talking to us like people. And then we go out into the real world, you know, if we're ordering off of like these smart whatevers and, and you know, these chat windows popping up and, and stuff like that. I think it's going to only become more of that human-like machines selling us stuff. But the problem, though, is that then you go and, you know, people are being really rude to like their baristas. And <laughs> being really rude to right. light attendants. Oh, because we're trained, we can be so mean to like. We're trained. Well, it's, it's the classic, like you're typing into support, like go fuck yourself because you <laughs> yeah, assume exactly. it's a machine. And then it turns out it's like a real person. Yeah. You're like, oh, oops. Oh, like, oops. yeah. But then also like, oops, right? Do you, do you worry on the, like being nice to the AI systems for, for law? Like, I don't know. There's some people like, oh, you should be nice to it because it could uh, be sentient someday. Um, I mean. Yes, I do say please and thank you. I got rid of the, uh, I got rid of Alexa. I have a Sonos now, but I, I feel like it's slightly less evil. But, yeah. uh, but I say, yeah, I say please and thank you, not because I care about it memorizing whether I was polite. Robots will not give any, they don't care if we're polite. They're not going to, but I'm modeling in, an interaction with a human like uh, entity to my children right. and to myself. And so, do I want to be the kind of person who's, a jerk and shouts, you know, at the, the, no, like, I don't want my children to be like that either. So I say, please. And thank you. Uh, I try not to be too. I mean, sometimes it is, it gets a little bit annoying whenever <laughs> it gets everything wrong. All right. My final question, will AI kill us all? Like, do you, is it in, in the sort of end of humanity mm -hmm. chances, where do you put sort of robots and AI being sort of the cause of our demise? Um, you know, I don't, I think again, it's those psychotic apes, you know, <laughs> if you're going to read a, if you're going to read a story about the, uh, the role of machines in the demise of man, I would read, uh, there will come soft rains by Ray Bradbury. Yeah. 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 And, uh, yep. they'll just be keeping on, keeping on trying to do their thing and it'll be us. <laughs> We, we kill each other in nuclear war, but the machines, uh, the machines keep going, keep on trying to do their thing, man. <laughs> Um, Daniel H. Wilson, yeah. thank you so much for coming on the show. I really, it was a great time to chat with you. Cool, man. It was a pleasure. That's our episode. Thanks so much to Max Child and James Wilson and Avali, my co hosts. I'm Eric Newcomer. Shout out to Scott Brody, our producer, uh, Riley Kinsella, chief of staff for Newcomer, 
uh, Gabby Caliendo at Bali, who's helping so much with the conference behind the scenes. Oh, and of course, to Young Chomsky for the wonderful theme music. This episode is part of the Cerebral Valley series that I'm doing on the Newcomer podcast. Uh, you can follow along on my Substack at newcomer.co, where I'm publishing each episode, or you can follow it on YouTube or Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, thanks so much. Goodbye.